Hi everyone, Grandmaster Ben Feingold here. Now, the chess content of this video will be poor, but the rest of it will be exciting. So, I have many things to announce. Well, I got a lot of your, you know, complaints, suggestions. The main one was I deleted comments, but of course I ignored you because who are you? However, uh, my wife said, no, put the comments back. And I said, yes, dear. So the comments are back. So I expect more donations, rawr. And I guess several times a day, I'll have to delete comments and ban people and contact the authorities based on stuff that I've seen. But I guess if less people do that, that would be nice. Um, please go to my uh, website, atlchessclub.com and keep donating. The more you donate, the more comments I'll read. And... Um, I'm going to be in St. Louis several times over the next uh, five months just to let you know my schedule. I'll be playing in a Grandmaster tournament March 10th, I'm sorry, March 11th to 19th, one round a day, stronger than the last one I played in. I think eight or nine of the players will be Grandmasters, I think eight, and then there'll be two IMs, although one of them is higher rated than me. The average rating will be about 25, 30. And that's March 11th to 19th. They're also having a Grandmaster tournament that's average rating is 2650 at the same time. And there will be live commentary by the usual Yasser and whoever else is there, Maurice or Jennifer or Tanya, somebody. Um, Alejandro will not be doing commentary because he's playing in my group. And I've never played Alejandro a rated game. So I'll play him for the first time next month. Okay. And then at the end of March, beginning of April, I'll be doing commentary at the U.S. Championship, not on the internet, but live that's March 28th to April 10th. And the whole month of June, I will be in St. Louis as the Grandmaster in residence. So if you love seeing my pretty face, um, I'll probably make about 15 videos in June that will be put on the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis's YouTube page, which I'm sure you're all subscribing to anyway. Okay, so that's the next few times I'm in St. Louis uh, doing work. Now, uh, I showed my game with Mama Jarov, which actually has more views than any video I've made, including my MVL video by quite a bit. You guys like my Mama Jarov game, as do I. Um, so this I'm going to show, not very exciting game, but there's some interesting variations. I played Andre Gorovets in the last round of the Winter Norm Invitational. Um, of course I drew. And that actually gave me seven draws, one win and one loss. My USCF went down, probably my FIDE will break even. Andre Gorovets actually was the highest rated player in the event at 25-33 FIDE. And I thought he was a GM and got all of his norms, but I guess not. And he was actually on his way to a norm this tournament. He had two and a half out of three, which is a pretty good score. And um, unfortunately, in the middle of the tournament, he had half out of three. So after seven rounds, he had 50%. And since the norm is plus four, that was the end of his chances. And he won in round eight, and we drew in round nine. Um, I had the black pieces, and for those of you who don't like my quick games, uh, one time when I played Andre Gorovets, our game went 93 moves, and I think six hours, and it was also a draw. And I suffered for most of that game. Well, the last 15 moves, I was playing for the win, but for the first 75 moves, I was worse. Okay, so Andre played C4. Now, one good thing about this game is I didn't prepare for it, because when I looked at my database getting ready to prepare, I noted that he played c4, d4, e4, and knight f3 on move one, and played almost every opening. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to prepare, I'll just play what I play. Um, so he played c4, and I played c6, which I often do against c4. And we could transpose to a Karakhan or a Slav, uh, or some other kind of Rady. And he actually played the way that two people have played against me before, this, this position. Um, and I always play g6 whenever they play e3 in these Slav kind of positions because the bishop on c1 can't go out to f4 or g5. Then probably white has an advantage. And I don't play e6 because that's the semi-Slav, and I don't know that. Um, but I do know g6. I've played this many times. And after d4, we just transpose into a regular position. I've had this position many times. Um, and the variation that my opponent played, uh, Andre Gorovitz in this case, was played against me twice in the last five years. Once by Sam Shankland in a Michigan tournament. That game isn't published anywhere, so he doesn't know about that game. That was in a Swiss. And I also played John Bartholomew, who also makes YouTube videos. A lot of people like his videos more than mine. So you should also subscribe to John Bartholomew's uh, YouTube page if you haven't already. He's an international master in Minnesota. 
and uh, his USCF rating is 2,500, and his FIDE rating is about 2,450, I believe. Um, and John should probably be a grandmaster, but he doesn't have the norms yet. Uh, and Bartholomew and Sam Shanklin both played the move H3 against me. The obvious idea is to stop Bishop G4. Well, unfortunately for these guys, I also play white when I play chess. I also play D4, and I've actually played H3 before Shanklin and Bartholomew were born. So I know a lot about H3. Um, I don't think H3 is the best move, but it's okay. And I beat Bartholomew in a 1,000 moves, and I drew Shanklin relatively quickly. So I've had good results. Okay, now I'm playing Gorovets, Castles. And I think since H3 is sort of slow, black should play aggressively. Um, and this isn't a common move, but I like it. I'm playing C5. So basically, instead of having a Slav Grunfeld or Schlechter Slav, whatever you want to call it, now it's just a Grunfeld, except black is a tempo down, and white has made two very strange moves, bishop d3 and h3. In fact, you could say e3 is a strange move if you want. So it's a Grunfeld where white's playing very weird, but white has an extra tempo. And actually, we transpose into another opening very quickly. After castles, I traded everything. Now against Bartholomew, I played knight c6 here. And for some reason, I was worried about c5, so I just took on c4, okay? And this position here, after knight c6, and a6 is another move, and the idea is to play b5 and bishop b7 and so forth. Um, after knight c6, this is actually a theoretical position with white up two tempi. And in fact, I'm going to confuse you at home, and I'm going to go back and show you what I mean. Okay, so let's pretend that white plays the queen's gambit declined, I guess both sides are playing the Queen's Gambit decline since black is declining it. Okay, and then black plays the Tarish variation. Very popular when Kasparov played it often uh, against Karpov. Okay, and we get this very, 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 very normal position. Can't get more normal than this in the Tarish. Okay, in this position, white always plays bishop to g5, even if he doesn't. And if you look at a database, there's probably 3,000 games in that position. Okay. But imagine if white didn't play bishop g5 because it wasn't his turn, and black played the move h6. And imagine further that after h6, black gets to move again. So you would think white is slightly better in this position by playing bishop g5. He's white, and black's playing a mildly unusual variation of the queen's gambit. But if black got to play h6 and black got to move again, you might think black has at least equalized. Well, actually... Uh, that's the position we have with colors reversed. So imagine the f that this color here is black instead of white and vice versa. That's the position I have. And now when I click, okay, basically the board just flipped. So it's the same position except I'm black instead of white and I'm down two tempi. Why am I down two tempi? Well, I'm black, so I'm down one tempo and I played C6 and then C5 or I played C6 to B5. Wow. Okay, teaching too many kids lately. Okay, so my opponent thought a long time here, and it seems like if it was my move, I could play knight a5, he would have to go back to e2, and then I could play bishop e6, and I have good play on the white squares. So I think his move is best. He played a3. And the idea is, if I play knight a5, he plays bishop a2, and I'm definitely not playing bishop e6 now. Okay, and I don't control the white squares anymore. I can't play knight c4. I can't play knight d5. So why is my knight on a5? Okay, so I like a3. The other idea behind a3 is I can't play knight b. I can't play knight b4 and have control over d5. And so a3 makes a lot of sense. Okay, so black has solved all of his problems except the bishop on c8. Um, I didn't really want to go to f5 because I thought. Just did nothing on f5. Um, so I wanted to feed and cut on my bishop. And so I played b6. Okay. And he thought a very long time here again. He played a really interesting move, queen to d3. And the idea is he can defend his pawn with the rook or the queen instead of defending it in a very passive way with bishop to e3, which blocks the e-file. And you might say, well, why is he defending his d-pawn? Who cares? Well, it's isolated. I can attack it. And later in the game, white might want to play knight e5, so he should have his d-pawn protected more. Um, 
So queen d3 is an interesting move. The other thing that it does is if I play knight a5, I can't play bishop a6 here because it's hanging. If his queen wasn't on d3, I could play bishop a6, attacking his rook, and once again, I could get into the c4 square. So I like queen d3. It's a very interesting move. Okay, I played bishop b7. I completed development. He played rook to d1, defending his d-pawn. Now he could play something like bishop to g5 or knight e5, although I think rook g1 is probably a mild error. The rook's probably better on e1, and probably bishop g5 right away is more aggressive. His other rook could go to d1. Okay, and now I got everything done. I cast all my pieces around. He has an isolated pawn. But what do I do? I can't really move anything anywhere. I can't move anything into the center because it's all hanging. So I wanted to get the d5 square, but he has another firm control. So I played knight a5, tagging his bishop, and now I have d5. Bishop a2 and knight to d5. Okay, and now I'm pretty happy because I did what I wanted to do, and there's no real negative. I can't, he, I can't say, oh, no, he's going to do this. Okay, and he didn't seem too pleased here because he was taking a long time, and it seems like I've equalized. Um, well, it's fair that I should equalize. I didn't really make any mistakes yet. Okay, not yet. Play bishop d2, which is pretty passive. And I could play rook c8 here, but I played knight takes c3. And the idea is, if he, plays with, if he takes with a pawn, and I play bishop to d5, if he lets me and I play rook c8 and get c4, he's just worse. I mean, he's going to have a bad position. If he plays c4 to get c4, I can take on f3, and he's going to lose his d-pawn. And his bishop is blocked by his c-pawn. It's not so good. So he didn't like any of that. So instead of taking with a b-pawn and possibly having a weak pawn on c3 on a half-open file, which I can blockade, he took with the bishop. Obviously leaving himself with his d, you know, weak d-pawn. And I play bishop d5 and offer to draw. Um, I equalize pretty easily with black. Of course, the computer says all zeros. It always does that. And there's actually more than one interesting variation here. One variation is uh, to take on, I'm sorry, take on a5. And I take, and you take, and I take. And you could argue who's better here. I have doubled isolated pawns on the a-file, but his d-pawn's weak, my bishop's great, my rooks can go to all these open files. Of course, the computer says equal. And you could also play b4, takes, takes. The idea is, if I move my knight away, I'm not getting the c4 square. So he can you know, take the e file with either of his rooks. His knight has e5. Could play d5 at some point. So if I want c4, I'd play queen d5 attacking his rook. And now my knight gets to c4. Then I'm pretty happy. And that involves a pawn sacrifice with the move rook e2. Um, or so I thought when I was analyzing during the game, and then I realized, oh, wait a minute, if he takes my pawn, I can take his pawn. Knight takes the pawn on a3, and even though white has a passed pawn, I think because my knight can go back to b5 later, putting pressure on everything, my rook can go to, either rook can go to d8, I can get a passed pawn myself. I thought black was doing okay here, and the computer says black is slightly better. So all these really interesting lines seem like they're equal or black is a little bit better. And after thinking a while, even though he doesn't like taking draws, he likes to play for the win, especially when he's white, and especially since he's the highest rated player in the tournament, he accepted. So not the most exciting game for the spectators, but I thought it was interesting from a personal point of view, analyzing during the game and afterwards the variations that could have happened and whether or not black can get away with losing a tempo in the opening with c6 and c5. So interesting game for the players, uh, maybe not for the spectators, but there's lots of interesting stuff going on in the world. We don't need to have every chess game be interesting. Okay, this is Grandmaster Ben Feingold. Um, go to my Facebook and Twitter, CCSCA, the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Um, follow me everywhere except in real life. Uh, please like and subscribe to my YouTube page, and don't forget to donate. The more you donate, the more moves I play. Unfortunately... You guys didn't donate very much lately. However, right before my game with a wonder, you guys donated a lot. So I played 101 moves. And if you believe that, then I have some more stuff to tell you. All right. I hope you like this video. A new microphone is coming because you guys complain a lot. 
Also, chess.com sent me one for free. And I'm going to start making videos for chess.com soon. Um, so check that out. I don't think you're going to see me, but you'll see me somewhere. And if you're a child or a coach and you're going to the Super Nationals this year, I'll be there working for chess.com. So come say hi and bring a nice size check. Okay, bye everyone.